All right, so hello everyone and welcome to uh, this session. I'm Andrea and I will be your host today. I'm glad to welcome Stefan today, who is an associate professor at Radboud University in the Netherlands. His research interests are cryptography, machine learning and evolutionary computation. Researchers have used machine learning in side channel analysis for more than 10 years and deep learning for six years. We witnessed significant progress showing clear benefits of using such techniques. And today uh, we will talk, uh, we will cover the most important challenges and some possible directions on how to solve them. Additionally, we will also briefly discuss the most success successful stories and how they improve the state of the art. The presentation will consist of 30 minutes followed by, by a 10 minute Q&A session. If you have any questions, please share them in the chat box and we will answer after the presentation is over. Uh, you can start your presentation, Stefan. So thank you, uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and yeah, the opportunity to talk a bit more about deep learning based side channel analysis and what are the challenges, what are the perspectives we have. So um, I, will, I will start with, uh, with, let's say basics, where I will just give you a quick introduction to side channel attacks. Why do we care about deep learning for side channel analysis? Then I will show you a couple of recent results that uh, that uh, my group did that I feel are interesting, something in chat, uh, okay? And then I will finish with enumerating a number of challenges and there are many more challenges, but I, I let's say I said 10 is enough for this, uh, for this short talk. And then there will be opportunity for us also to discuss why are those challenges important and what they actually mean to, to progress deep learning based side channel analysis. So uh, outline of the talk, profiling side channel, then challenges and very short conclusions. When we talk about side channel attacks, so side channel attacks are type of implementation attacks. As, as such, they do not aim at the weakness of the algorithm, but on the implementation of the algorithm. And side channel attacks are passive, non-invasive attacks. And today, side channel attacks represent one of the most powerful categories of attacks on crypto devices. In a similar way, like we say this, profiling attacks, which is one category of side channel attacks represent probably the most powerful option for side channel analysis. So if we compare with direct attacks like CPA, um, profiling attacks have a little bit more uh, restrictions from the perspective of the assumptions. So profiling attacks assume the attacker has access to a copy of a device, but if the attacker has it, the, the option to make the attack becomes much more powerful. And in the similar way, like profiling attacks are the most uh, powerful ones uh, of side channel attacks, uh, deep learning represents today the most powerful option for profiling side channel. Of course, this could be a little bit um, controversial uh, claim because um, let's say more traditional profiling attacks like template attack, they are also very well established in industry, in, for instance, certification labs, while deep learning is used, of course, but still I would dare to say represents something uh, much more uh, interesting from the academic perspective. So we as researchers are convinced deep learning attacks work and they, they allow us to break different targets very efficiently. But at the same time, uh, industry, whether they their results follow uh, the results from academia, this is a little, little bit more questionable. And I will discuss later what are possible doubts for, for what I'm saying. Okay, so what are the profiling attacks? Well, profiling attacks are two-stage attacks. So they consist of two stages. The first stage is called profiling. And in that stage, the adversary, the attacker, estimates leakage models for targeted computation. And then in the second phase, commonly known as the attack phase, uh, that model is used to extract secret information. And then when we talk about profiling attacks, a common example is the template attack. Uh, 
presented in 2002, so already 20 years of the attack, and it's very powerful, but it's also the most powerful attack from the information theoretic point of view, but really to reach that power of template attack, some assumptions need to be fulfilled. Since in reality, uh, we do not have always that kind of assumptions fulfilled, uh, template attack often, let's say, loses on its power. And we can think of other techniques that need possibly less assumptions that can provide a strong uh, alternative. And one group of techniques is machine learning deep learning. Well, immediately from the description when I said, well, uh, profiling attacks consists of two phases. So we have the profiling phase and we have the attack phase. One could say, okay, this sounds very similar to supervised learning in machine learning. And this is indeed true. So what we call profiling is basically what we in machine learning call training and what we call uh, attacking is what we call in machine learning test. So indeed, uh, there is a natural connection between profiling attacks and supervised machine learning. And that gives us the option to use all those many algorithms developed over decades from machine learning domain to actually mount very powerful side channel attacks. That being said, of course, one could say yes, but do we have that copy of a device we require for profiling phase? Uh, this is a common assumption to, to be done. Of course, attack like that is more difficult than direct attack. But if we do manage to have a copy of a device, and if we do manage to build a good model, then our attack performance can be extremely good. So this is a general scheme how prof all the profiling attacks would work. So we have two devices, device under attack, an identical copy of that device. Then we have our PC to build the profiling model, for instance, our machine learning or template. And then we feed many different configurations of plain text keys to an identical copy. We observe the measurements and we build a model of a device. Once we have a model, we attack the device under attack, where we have, again, the plain text info, but also we have our model. We again observe the measurements based on that information. We guess the key. The better the model, the better the key guess. So going a little bit more, um, uh, more formal for deep learning, we could also uh, devise this uh, deep learning based side channel in a setup like this. So we would start with oscilloscope with a device uh, that we want to attack we would obtain the raw measurements. And basically, uh, this is, let's say, engineering phase. There is not, not so much uh, differentiation what we can do. I mean, it's well-known procedure how to do the data acquisition. And this is standard. And in academia, mostly, this step is even not taken, but researchers just take the data sets that are publicly available. Then we come to a step of data pre-processing where we would clean noise, remove incomplete measurements, and so on. Then we would come to the phase of feature engineering, where for simpler techniques, for instance, we would uh, find the most informative features that we want to use. While for deep learning, we would hopefully work with as many features as possible and leave it for deep learning to find what are the important features. Next step, we need to select the algorithm. So in deep learning context, what kind of neural network do you want to use? For instance, do you want to use multi-layer perceptrons or convolutional neural networks as the two most common examples today? After we select the algorithm, we select all the hyperparameters, we reach the model training phase where we are building our model. Once we have our model, we are ready to do the attack evaluation where we use the model and we guess the key and based on uh, on the how well did we guess the key we estimate the performance with some of the side channel metrics like key rank like guessing entropy like success rate okay so from from this number of steps from a to f the question we can immediately try to understand is what phases are the most important 
um, for for deep learning based side channel analysis, while what phases are, let's say, less relevant or less explored at, up to the moment. So first of all, raw data, yeah, like I already said, there is almost nothing there. So we collect the data and that is all. So this is nothing specific to deep learning. Data pre-processing is currently something that is very much neglected in machine learning, deep learning perspective, where there are only few works where, for instance, people would do data augmentation, so maybe build more, more measurements, synthetic measurements to increase the performance, or maybe remove the noise, remove the countermeasures. But all in all, this phase is very much neglected. Uh, next is feature engineering. Like I already said, in this phase, we would select the most important features, or we would leave it for neural network to decide what are the important features. Currently, um, it's less clear how important is the feature engineering. Simple reason is this. At the moment when we started doing deep learning, immediately we started with the arguments, deep learning can do implicit feature selection. As such, we do not need but interestingly, despite the, those sentences, uh, people commonly do, um, let's say, feature engineering in the sense that they select a window of features they consider important. So while we commonly say, yes, we do not need feature engineering, I always find it interesting that I believe 90% of papers still has feature engineering. Then algorithm selection model training, there is a, most of the works consider this. So what is the good architecture? What are the important hyperparameters? How to tune them? Can we do automated tuning? Do we need to do uh, tuning at all? So this is, this is a, a, a questions uh, that we still don't know good answers. We, we know many answers, we know many good results, but we are still missing all the information to build a complete picture. And finally, the attack evaluation where we know very well how to evaluate the side channel performance. But we, what we do not know all the time is how to map the side channel performance with the machine learning metrics we commonly measure during the training process. Okay, so let me, let me uh, give you very quickly a couple of topics connected with feature engineering that I consider to be interesting. So, like I already said, uh, while we say we do not need feature engineering for deep learning and side channel, still we kind of do it, at least from academic perspective. But then the question remains, can we actually get better performance if we do not do feature selection, if we leave for deep learning to do it on its own? Or would it, there be maybe consequences of, of, of uh, decision like that in the sense that the performance would decrease or maybe the performance would decrease, but we would pay that with the necessity to having much more complicated neural network architectures. And this is also very important. If, if you are uh, checking and um, up to date with the latest results for deep learning based side channel analysis, you will notice that actually most of neural networks that we use are very simple, very small. So only a couple of layers and we break the target. So the question is, if we now use much bigger traces, would we pay this with performance? So having worse attacks or and would we pay it with the size of the neural network we need to use? And this is the question we also tried recently to answer because there was a paper 2021 doing some experiments with ASCAD and ASCAD is the, among other data sets, the data sets that are commonly used in academic research. And actually the, the, the authors, so the paper is called Pay Attention to Raw Traces uh, at, from Chess last year. And the authors show that when you use raw traces, you can get much better attack performance. So you can break target with less attack traces. But in a way they paid a price for doing that because they required a significantly more complex architectures around even up to around 50 layers. And while for many domains, 50 layers will not be a lot, 
for, for us, for side channel, this is significantly larger than we are commonly used to see. And immediately one can ask the question, since we do not know how, what are the important hyperparameters, how to do a good hyperparameter tuning, having so much bigger architecture comes with the price of maybe having much longer tuning process. So uh, recently we tried to devise a couple of interesting scenarios that makes sense to evaluate in the context of deep learning. And we recognize three scenarios, well, we call uh, Erpoi, Opoi, Nopoi. So uh, points of interest selection, optimized, non-optimized, rest uh, restricted. So basically it means, do you assume you know, the, for instance, the mask, and do you know where are the main SNR peaks? So in, in a way, this gives us from, from the easiest scenario, from the evaluation perspective, from the evaluator, knowing the details all the way to no point where the evaluator doesn't know anything and is kind of uh, forced to work with raw traces. And what we actually saw is that working with more features, so something that looks like raw traces or at least has significantly more features than commonly used, actually improves attack performance significantly. So you can see here that we can break the target, and this is as a random key data set with and without uh, uh, data augmentation, with even a single attack trace. So we could break ASCAD, which was realistically speaking, uh, speaking up to recently, uh, a data set that was considered a good, good uh, benchmark to assess the performance, we can break it with a single trace. And of course, this is nothing new from the practical perspective, whether you break it in one trace or five traces or 10, 20, it's not so important. What is important that we needed only extremely small architecture to do this. So while, we, like I said already, recent work said 50 layers maybe, actually we managed to do this with only two or three hidden layers. So we do see that even if when we work with a huge number of features, we can use still extremely small neural networks and get amazingly well performance. So it does seem that more features is better. And at least at the moment, it's, it does seem that we do not need to pay huge price in the architecture size to use that additional information coming from more features. Continuing with the, with the topic of features, a similar question we can ask, Okay, features are definitely important. Depending how we select features or do we select them, we get good or bad performance. Can we select features in such a way that we can make other profiling techniques also better perform? So think of it in this setup. Can we do feature selection, for instance, for template attack that would make template attack uh, rival the, the performance of deep learning? And actually, if we do uh, feature selection with the, uh, with the techniques from uh, deep learning, we can reach that kind of performance. What did we do? We used similarity learning. So where the goal is to learn a similarity function, measuring how similar, how related two objects are. And then we used the concept of triplet learning, where a triplet would consist of three samples, positive, anchor, negative positive and anchor would have the same label, while uh, that label would be different for negative sample. And we would get a setting like that. We obtain leakage traces, we have labels, we feed them to the triplet network. Uh, we reach some embeddings, so some, um, some uh, latent space uh, representation of our features. And those features that also use the labels, so do not uh, mix it, for instance, with outer encoders, which is unsupervised deep learning technique. This is a supervised technique. So we add the information about the label into selection of most important features. Once we feed those into the attack mechanism, we can actually see that we can reach template attack performance, something that is very similar to state of the art. So here I just give a couple of um, slides uh, comparison 
So well, not all the numbers are here because the, the comparison is not fully fair, but for instance, methodology paper. So this was the paper that proposed the methodology for convolutional networks for uh, deep learning, BO, Bayesian optimization for automated hyperparameter tuning, R RL for reinforcement learning, and then different techniques how to do um, uh, how to do feature reduction in a more traditional way. So either principal component analysis or linear discriminant analysis or SOST or autoencoder. So we can see that the smart feature selection coupled with template attack can actually give you even better performance than using powerful deep learning techniques or some other feature selection techniques combined, for instance, with template attack. Uh, hyphen means the, uh, we could not break the target with the number of uh, attack traces we had at our disposal. So you can see here, indeed, uh, it's not only that we can use deep learning to do powerful attacks, but we could also use deep learning to make better feature selection that allows us to use even simpler techniques and still result in powerful attacks. Uh, that being said, let me then just give you a very, very brief uh, pitch that if you like deep learning side channel analysis, and maybe you do not know from where to start because there are so many techniques, so many things to consider. Um, we, we recently published open source framework called IC, and it's intended for deep learning based side channel analysis. It has also some graphic user interface, integrated database, so state-of-the-art results. You can generate um, reproducible scripts, so even uh, scripts that uh, store all the, all the random values, everything, so that indeed every time you run your experiment, you get exactly the same result. And of course, theme work and so on and so on. So if you, if you like the opportunity to use a tool like this, uh, we, we have the version currently, it's already, let's say, 0 0.2. And you can, you can uh, download it. Uh, there is also nice documentation. If you think the tool is cool, but is missing something important, send us mail. We, will, uh, we are also adding new functionalities all the time. So we will do our best to add new functionalities that community considers important. Let's, uh, yeah, this is just a graphical depiction of what the tool can do. So it can do quite a lot, basically, all those things I talked up to now. So hyperparameter tuning, different models, different metrics, uh, visualization, data augmentation, all those things are possible within the tool. And finally, let me tell you very shortly, what are the possible challenges? What, what are the things we as the community need to address in next one? five years. So first, we are missing a functional approach for the unsupervised deep learning based side channel analysis. What we do up to now is supervised. And there are some attempts towards unsupervised deep learning, first one being 2019 paper by Benjamin Timon. But uh, when we talk about practicality, the cost the, uh, to, to do that kind of attack is maybe too significant to be always practical. So we need more functional approaches for unsupervised deep learning. Any new results in this domain would be, in my opinion, extremely important for the community. Second challenge is that most of the targets that we are considering are software implementations offering limited countermeasures. As such, we commonly report deep learning working amazingly nice, breaking targets easily. But when you talk with people from industry, they will use much more difficult targets, hardware devices, stronger countermeasures, and commonly then you reach a huge gap where we as the academic community say, yes, deep learning works amazingly and we break whatever we want. And industry saying, yeah, yeah, deep learning is very interesting, but for us it's crazy amount of work to make anything happen. And still we do not get, not 
even close nice performance as as you claim to be possible. So there is quite a big gap we need to see how to how to resolve. The third challenge is data augmentation. So do we need synthetic measurements to improve the performance? So ideally, I would say the answer seems to be yes, because there is already a number of papers doing data augmentation, and we always see improved results, but strangely, still it does not seem very well uh, accepted in the community. So not all the papers consider that they need data augmentation. And indeed, one could say, well, if I break the target, do I need data augmentation? But from other side, one could say, yes, you break the target, but maybe you would break it with even much less traces if you did data augmentation. So we, we are still missing clear results on that. Do we need feature engineering? If yes, in what form? The answer seems to be more and more, no, we do not need feature engineering if we wanna use deep learning. And yes, we need very smart feature engineering if you want to use simpler techniques like template. Uh, next, since we are in deep learning setup, uh, we want to know how to build good neural networks. But we need efficient guidelines how to build those networks. So people currently use random search and then just search, search, search until uh, they are happy or they use Bayesian optimization, or they use reinforcement learning, or they use genetic algorithms. All those techniques seem to work, but people still require better guidance, ideally methodologies. So we already have some methodologies, but more work is needed, especially when we consider realistic targets. Why is this so important? Well, as long as we work with extremely small neural networks like we commonly do, one could say it is not very important because we can get great results with small number of tuning experiments efficient. But if you really need to increase our neural networks to be very large, then the hyperparameter tuning will become extremely expensive. And then having guidelines how to do it would make practically huge difference. Connected question is, what are the important hyperparameters? There are so many different hyperparameters for neural networks. Are they all important? Or can we just say, well, I will always use ReLU activation function and I don't need even to check what's happening with other ones. Do we require custom neural network elements? So for instance, recently we started a trend, we started seeing a trend in side channel and deep learning to make side channel specific uh, loss functions. And the results are very good. So do we need more elements like that? Can we build universal models? So can we build architectures that are good against various data sets, not only one data set, one architecture? Next one, explainability. So why do we do attacks? We do attacks to understand the security of a device. But if the attack is successful, the natural answer should be okay, the attack is successful because of this, and now we can do that to make it more secure. But with deep learning, we are missing this step. We say, well, we broke the target, but we don't understand what the neural network did, why it broke the target. Without that understanding, we don't know how to make better design. So we need explainability. And of course, one big challenge for anyone, especially new people coming to the domain, there are so many things already done. So from 2016, end of 2016, there is already more than 200 papers on deep learning based side channel analysis. For someone who wants to use important and uh, good options, and when I say good, I mean uh, efficient from the practical perspective, it's a lot of work to understand where to start, what to take, what to change. And finally, to conclude, uh, I would just say deep learning is efficient and powerful option for side channel analysis. I think with all the results we have up to now, this is clear. And current results are very, very promising as we can break protected targets, even with very small architecture. What is less clear is how would the approach that we are currently using, all the approaches we are currently using, scale 
for more realistic targets. And of course, I, again, I repeat, the big challenges are unsupervised deep learning, functional unsupervised deep learning based side channel analysis, and explainable AI, explainable machine learning for side channel analysis. That being said, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer, or at least try answer them. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to share their questions in the chat box if they have any. Probably it was a lot to digest in one go. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there is something. <laughs> Why is the Q in green? Why is Q in green? Hmm. Well, because I, uh, um, that's not a good question for me, actually. I stole this uh, uh, question slide from a, from a colleague, so I should ask him why he put uh, Q in green. All right. No, Are there any metrics uh, for DL side channel resistance, like remaining entropy? Um, well, there, there are, uh, there are uh, metrics um, in general that we can somehow combine deep learning and, and side channel, like perceived information, for instance. So this is the, uh, something very much connected with the uh, categorical cross entropy. So we could say perceived information from one side on side channel and categorical cross entropy on the other side as, as uh, machine learning. So there is a match between those two, but for deep learning side channel resistance, we do not have, as far as I know, something specific. We just have the notion of successfulness of attack. So then we could say, well, the resistance is the absence of successfulness. But I, I, I'm not aware of any, any very specific metrics beyond those information theoretic metrics saying how successful the attack is. Um, mm -hmm. Could this deep learning based side channel be applied for other attacks like identifying instructions being executed in a CPU from the noise uh, raw data? This is a very good question. To be honest, I do not know. Uh, let me explain a bit more. Uh, intuitively, I would say, yes, it could be. Uh, I know many people tried things like that and many people more or less failed. Um, the, the CPU, uh, uh, so the data coming from CPU is commonly extremely long traces measurements. And then you get in a setup where you need to use extremely large neural network architectures. And then it seems we are still a bit lacking the knowledge in the, uh, in the side channel security community, how to use powerful architectures for things like that. So intuitively, I would say the answer should be yes, because anyway, deep learning doesn't know what is CPU data versus what is power me uh, measurement or electromagnetic radiation. It is more the quality of the information contained in the traces and how complex is that information. So the less quality of a measurement, we require uh, more, more data. Um, and the more data there is, we require possibly more complex architectures that are able to model that complex relationships. Um, so I, this is something I think in general will be uh, covered more in future. I think we will be seeing more of those CPU-based attacks and uh, deep learning in future. There are a couple of works in last year or so, and I believe more and more will show up. Um, so now the question is, uh, there is limited research with countermeasures, but any, any idea yet which might be strong or weak? Timing randomization may be due to timing bias. Indeed, indeed. 
So uh, ba based on the experiments we did, uh, hiding doesn't seem as powerful as masking. Although, of course, that also depends on the, on the level of hiding. So if we hide in the amplitude domain, and then we add crazy amount of noise, of course, that is difficult. If we uh, hide in the timing domain and we add crazy amount of desynchronization, that is, of course, difficult. In general, what we see, uh, timing variants of convolutional neural networks fight very nicely against timing randomization, and global desynchronization is more easy to defeat than local desynchronization. So desynchronization is easy, while jitter or random delay interrupts are more difficult. Similarly, on masking side, Boolean masking, well, at least first order masking seems relatively easy. Higher order maskings are actually not tested, so difficult to say. And also there is the, uh, the additive masking, so multiplicative something that seems to be much more difficult. So for instance, if we compare ASCAD V1 that has Boolean masking and ASCAD V2 that has affine uh, masking, seems the affine one to be much more difficult because the operation there is multiplication. And for neural network to, to learn the multiplication operation, that is intuitively significantly more difficult than just XOR. But some very precise evaluation of different countermeasures and gradation, uh, we do not have. We have more intuitions. Data implementations seem valuable, but how best to make the model flexible across parts implementation with different process variation? Yeah, this is very good, very good question. Uh, so it, it depends. Um, it, it very much depends. So this is connected also with portability. Uh, what does seem as a very good option for, for data augmentation would be maybe to use uh, generative adversarial networks where they would be used um, not only to make new measurements, but also we could make more powerful uh, loss functions. So uh, that also incorporate the, the difference, so to, to mimic different devices, that could be one option for process variation, to, to use GANs to produce measurements that are intentionally similar in the sense, similar like they're coming from a similar device. So I think that would be one very interesting call. What is the state of the art in explainability of deep learning side channel attacks? State of the art seems almost nothing. There is a recent paper on gray box masking by people from uh, Luan and No. Uh, they do some work there. There is also one paper from, from my group from last year where we used actually ablation technique to understand hiding countermeasures. And it seems to work quite nicely. So, what is the ablation? It's the process like in. in uh, operations on brain, where you see what is the influence of, of a small change on a behavior. For instance, when you watch some movie with operation on a brain, you see a person, I don't know, playing a guitar, and then they touch wrong part of the brain, and then person stops playing because the person does not remember anymore how to play. So ablation for neural networks is something similar. You randomly disconnect, kill uh, some neurons, and see what what will be the output? If the output is the same, then basically it means that part of neural network was not doing anything important. If the output changes a lot, it means it was important. So based on that, we could actually build a abla ablation mechanism for explainability that actually told us for different hiding countermeasures, which are easier, which are more difficult. And indeed we see, uh, we saw that if we use something like small desynchronization, neural networks handle small desynchronization already in first layers. So already first layers are sufficient to break that kind of countermeasure. But if we add something like jitter, that is local desynchronization, more difficult to beat, you can see the more and more of activity of neural network 
happens in deeper layers, which means neural network needs to combine more things, uh, do a smarter feature extraction to handle more, those more difficult counter measures. So I would call this current state of the art in explainability of deep learning side channel analysis. Although honestly, I think we are still very far from anything that can be really used in practice. All right, thank you very much for answering okay. these questions. Um, I don't think we have any other questions, so I thank would you. like to thank you for the presentation and for being with us today. Of course. And, uh, guys, if you like the presentation today and you would like to learn more about this topic, Stepan will also deliver a training this June uh, in US in Santa Clara at Hardware IO where he will cover not only theory, but a lot of hands-on activities as well. Now, I would like to thank you for your attendance and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I wish you a nice evening. Thank you all. Have a bye nice bye. evening or day. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>